As many of you know, I've been very clued in to this Middle East conflict since it first began on October 7th. I've done Julie Noted's here giving updates about what's been going on in the war between Israel and Gaza. Dennis and I have talked about it ad nauseum on our show, Dennis and Julie. But today, I want to spend some time profiling two articles that I wrote about the subject. The first one I wrote at the end of October, and it was published in the Epic Times. The title of that is called Pay No Attention to the Country Behind the Curtain. And the second article I published just about a week ago, so at the beginning of November, and that was published in the American Mind, and it is called Carving Turkey from NATO. And I've got to say, just for a moment, I'm really proud of that title. A, for the pun, in case you didn't get it, and B, because Thanksgiving is right around the corner. And so if I do say so myself, I think it was a pretty damn good title. But putting my self-congratulatory moment aside, these are two really important articles, again, if I do say so myself, analyzing what I view as some of the potential hidden things going on behind the scenes in this Middle East conflict. The first article, I argued that China and its accomplice Russia were likely involved in the October 7th attack on Israel alongside Iran. And then in the second, the American Mind article, I argued that one of their biggest motives in potentially being involved, that is China and Russia, would be to sever Turkey from NATO and the European Union. Now, some of you may be listening and thinking, what the heck? Where is her evidence for this? What is she talking about? Why did these pieces or the, these publications publish her pieces. And that's the point of Julie Noted today, to go through and really explain step by step my argument. I want to say at the outset that I do not have, nor have I ever claimed to have, any hard and fast evidence that 100% points with total certainty to the fact that China and Russia are involved alongside Iran and that they are definitely trying to sever Turkey from NATO and the European Union, okay? This is speculative. Obviously, it is speculative backed by a lot of evidence, but I have to acknowledge that it is speculative. But I want to repeat something that I remarked just a few seconds ago, and that is that often in these conflicts, there are a lot of things going on behind the scenes that are not immediately apparent to us, especially in the first few weeks and months after something this momentous has occurred. And then later, we start to zoom out and see some of the puzzle pieces or the greater picture of how an unexplained event happened. So again, today, I am offering my hypothesis, my sense of things, and I'm merely just putting the possibility out there that there are some other actors and other agents with other agendas involved in this conflict besides the ones that are immediately apparent to us. But before we go into it, I want to quickly tell you about my pillow because all of us need a lot of rest in order to have the brain space to spend some time learning and retaining information about this conflict. So I encourage you to check out my pillow. I use many my pillow products, not just the my pillow that I sleep on. I also use my slippers. I walk into work every day actually wearing them, and then at the last minute I change into heels. I sleep on the Giza Dream bed sheets in addition to the my pillow, and I use my pillow towel sets. And you can get many of these items at a discount if you use the promo code Hartman, which is my last name spelled H A R T M A N. For a limited time, you'll get 60% off of the Giza Dream bed sheets. That comes with a 60-day money-back guarantee and a 10-year warranty. You'll receive a set for as low as $39.99 with the promo code Hartman. Just go to MyPillow.com and click on the radio listener square and use the promo code Hartman or call 1-800-566-6745 and use the promo code Hartman. Along with this offer, you will get deep discounts on many My 
MyPillow products, including the aforementioned MyPillow towel sets, the MyPillow mattress topper, among many other products. So please do check them out. Again, I just want to make it clear. I use these products. I really like them. I would not advertise them if I did not use them. So... I'm going to go through here, and don't worry, I'm not going to read verbatim specific passages or articles for the entirety of the Julie Noted episode, but I want to go through here step by step and really piece together the argument that I'm making. Before we get into that, I also want to quickly acknowledge at the outset, in addition to the main kind of thesis statement of this episode, which is that oftentimes in international wars and conflicts and unexplained events like these, there seem to be a lot of behind the scenes things going on. I also want to say that what we may be seeing right now is act one of several more acts in a really tragic unfolding play of world events. And I know that sounds sinister. And I know that many of us don't want to confront the possibility that there may be a World War III. And I'm not saying with certainty that there's going to be a World War III around the corner. But I'm also not ruling something like that, even if it is not that overt, out of the realm of question. Neil Ferguson is one of my favorite historians. And he observes, or he makes the argument, that World War II actually didn't start in 1939. People tend to think, or at least when you read in history books and you go to school, you are taught that World War II began in 1939 when Hitler invaded Poland. Neil Ferguson says, actually, World War II began not in 1939, but in 1931 when Japan invaded Manchuria. And then he says there were these successive kind of events, obviously Hitler going into parts of Austria, Czechoslovakia, and the Sudetenland before his 1939 invasion of Poland. And those were separate but very disconcerning events that threads, if you will, that all kind of came together into the start the official start of World War II in 1939. And I have to tell you, I think that is a really astute observation and argument. Who would have thought in the 1930s that whatever Japan was doing in Asia would have had anything to do with what Hitler and the Nazis were doing in Europe? But they converged. Those two seemingly separate phenomena and events had a strange and indeed rapid way of coming together. And so in tracing or contemplating the possibilities of these threads, I am trying to learn from the wisdom of Neil Ferguson's argument and try to assess, okay, what else is going on here besides the overt Hamas attacking Israel and then Israel going into Gaza? Who is behind this besides Iran? Who would stand to benefit from a kind of conflict in war like this? And to segue into my argument, I would like to make the argument that China and Russia benefit from it alongside Iran, okay? I know I said that I'm not going to read specific paragraphs. I'm going to read one, and it is the only one that I will read for the entire episode, but it is laying the groundwork of the argument, so it's very important to, I think, read it and have you hear it. This is from, again, the uh, American Mind piece that I wrote, Carving Turkey from NATO, and it also is basically this similar argument of the piece that I wrote in the Epic Times, okay? As the initial shock and disorientation of the October 7th massacre in Israel begins to recede, Americans must further contemplate Iran's involvement in the attack. In particular, we must face the possibility that Iran's support for Hamas is in turn part of a larger scheme approved, directed, and possibly conceived by still more powerful actors, namely China and its accomplice, Russia. These agents of disorder would benefit from conflict in the Middle East, both as a distraction and as a wedge to divide Western alliances, countries, and their constituent populations, helping to clear the path for China's hegemony. Wait, 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 Julie, oh my God, what are you saying? How do, what's your evidence? Where are you getting this from? Okay, let's take it one by one. 
First of all, October 7th was an attack like no other. Dennis Prager that morning on the radio, or actually, sorry, that was the, it was a Saturday, but the, the Monday, October 9th, so two days after, on the radio, had the very astute statement that the world changed on October 7th. Not to at all dismiss any of the other terrible terrorist attacks that Israel has suffered at the hands of Hamas, but this was completely different. There was a huge breach of intelligence, or as I like to contemplate, an intelligence penetration. People are saying, oh, Israel somehow failed to uncover this. Well, what if there was a mole? Are Mossad and Shin Bet somehow immune from harboring a spy as as we had here in the United States, we had people from the Soviet Union infiltrating into the CIA and the FBI spying on us. We have sent spies abroad. Is Israel somehow immune to that? Putting that aside, there was a huge intelligence failure or penetration, unlike anything Israel has ever experienced. The It was the single greatest number of Jews killed in a, in a day since the Holocaust. 1,400 people in Israel were killed on October 7th. Uh, some multiple of that were injured. And there were over 240 hostages that were taken by Hamas back into Gaza. Okay? Let's... Even if all of those hostages were Israeli hostages, that would be bad enough. But this was also an international hostage situation. There were people from other countries who were taken hostage outside of Israel, including, I think, over 10 Americans. So this was not only an attack like no other in its scale, but it also had international implications and reach. We know that Iran was involved in the attack. Iran has been funding Hamas for decades, also funding Hezbollah, the terrorist organization operating out of Lebanon in the north. We know, according to reporting by the New York Times, that Iran gave Hamas the go-ahead to perform the attack the Monday before October 7th in Beirut. But again, with an event this momentous, with international implications, the hostage crisis, a the unfolding refugee crisis because of Israel's invasion of Gaza, the possibility that surrounding nations, including Iran, may become involved. It doesn't seem likely to me that that was just a solo opus of one Jew-hating country, Iran, especially when we know who that Jew-hating country's friends are. China and Russia are their best friends. So when something this big was going to occur that was going to turn into a war, I think that it is pretty darn sound for me to argue that China and Russia at the very least knew about it and perhaps approved of it and even helped orchestrate it alongside Iran because it was going to have implications far outside of the borders of just Israel and Gaza. So that's the first thing to acknowledge. An event this momentous, I think, was a approved and at the very least uh, known about by these greater actors that work alongside Iran. The second thing is we really have to acknowledge that China, Russia, and Iran work in tandem with one another on so many things. So would this be different? Let's go through and remind ourselves of the various ways that China, Russia, and Iran support each other in their various wars or their various global initiatives. Well, Iran sells drones to Russia to help Russia in its war against Ukraine. Actually, Iran just opened a drone factory recently in a rural part of Russia to crank out even more of this weaponry. So Iran is helping Russia fight the war against Ukraine. Russia, in turn, provides financial and military assistance to Iran so that Iran can, in turn, give that to Hezbollah and Hamas to bring about Iran's own goals internationally. So that's uh, Iran and Russia. China works together with all of them. China is the biggest bile, buyer excuse me, of Iranian oil in the world. And 
China also has invested hugely in Iran's infrastructure. They've agreed to build a railway line in Tehran to industrialize the Ayatollah Khomeini International Airport in Tehran. And so they're, they really try to support each other because they know that they are stronger together in combating the West than if they were just acting alone. Also, China is really trying to spearhead these global anti-Western initiatives. And China has brought along Russia and, and Iran as its accomplices in bringing about a China centered hegemonic alternative world order to the Western dominated hegemonic world order that we have seen over the past century. For instance, China launched what was called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is a political alliance of non-Western countries. And literally their aim is to combat Western hegemony. Russia is a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and Iran joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization this past July of 2023. China also launched the Global Security Initiative to apply Chinese solutions and wisdom to world politics and to combat Western unilateralism, bloc confrontation, and hegemonism. Russia and Iran have voiced their support for this initiative, among others, and China's efforts to try to shift the geopolitical order away from the United States and Western alliances. For instance, Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi, in a visit with Chinese President Xi Jinping, said that Iran was vowing to combat, quote, Western hegemonic powers, and they wanted to reshape the international system to remove the dominance of the dollar. President Vladimir Putin, in a visit last March with Chinese President Xi Jinping, said that China and Russia are driving changes. This is a quote quote, driving changes that haven't happened in 100 years. And just to add more pieces of evidence, in August, Iran joined BRICS. BRICS is an acronym, and it stands for this group of nations, again, spearheaded by China, a group, this is an economic group that is trying to provide an alternative to Western hegemonic order. BRICS stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And Iran joined BRICS. And by the way, so did Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, and all of these other countries. Now, BRICS members compromise a third of global GDP. So if the past four minutes were confusing to you with all of the pieces of evidence I threw out, let me distill it into a single sentence. China, alongside Russia and Iran, are trying to establish an alternative, vehemently non-Western political and economic order. And China, Russia, and Iran work heavily with one another to try to achieve their goals, including their militaristic goals. So let's get this straight. If Iran is helping Russia in Ukraine, and China is helping Russia in Ukraine, and Russia is helping Iran, and China is helping Iran with Hezbollah and Hamas, are you telling me that China and Iran didn't know anything about the October 7th attack? Really? So they're just helping each other with everything else. But then, oh, October 7th was just approved and orchestrated only by Russia or only by Iran. No, China and Russia, again, as I am arguing, and I don't have complete certainty, but given the evidence here, I am arguing that they at the very least knew about it and probably were helping behind the scenes to make that attack as successful and as momentous as it was. Okay. So now we've established the first part of my argument, the Epic Times piece, because the Epic Times piece was kind of part one, and then the American Mind piece was kind of part two of my argument. We've established that China, Russia, and Iran work together, and that they all three have a vested interest in dividing the West and creating an alternative world order to Western hegemonism, okay? That is established. Given that, I think 
that there is a more specific objective in addition to this general objective. And their specific objective may be trying to sever Turkey's ties or diminish Turkey's ties to the West, namely in the form of their NATO membership and their European Union partnership. Okay? Again, oh my God, okay, Julie, I was with you up until the point of you're bringing Turkey into this. Why are you bringing Turkey into this? What does Turkey have to do with Israel and Gaza? Again, let's take a step back and remember World War II. There were all of these different things going on that seemed totally separate from one another, and then they had a way of converging. Let's also remember that these conflicts have a way of of kind of spinning out of control, affecting other things, and there are other influences and motives and things going on behind the scenes. And I think that China and Russia and Iran would love to see Turkey become disconnected from the West. And I think China, Russia, and Iran are very well aware that a war in Gaza would be very helpful to serving that aim. Why? Because a war in Gaza is featuring a Western power, Israel, with Western American weapons and financial and military support invading Gaza, which is a Sunni Muslim majority area. And these three powers know the optics of that, that it is going to create a lot of uproar, not just in the West, but in other countries, especially Muslim majority countries, of which Turkey is one. Turkey is the only Muslim majority member of NATO. How do you think the Turkish population which is majority Sunni Muslim, is reacting to seeing, again, a Western power, Israel, with Western military equipment invading and using that equipment against fellow Sunni Muslims in Gaza. Well, to give you a little sneak preview, they're not exactly happy with it. But before we get into that, again, let's back up. I want to take this step by step. I know that it's kind of a lot to consider. So let's first deal with the question of how China and Russia would benefit from disconnecting Turkey from NATO, the European Union, and Western alliances in general. Well, first of all, we know that China, Russia, and Iran are trying to establish this alternative world order. They have assembled and created political alliances, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, economic alliances, BRICS as one of them. And so they do not like seeing NATO grow and become stronger. Turkey, in case it wasn't clear, is a member of NATO. It as I said, is the only Muslim majority member of NATO. It joined in 1951. NATO was established after World War II in 1945. Turkey joined six years later, okay? So China, Russia, and Iran do not want to see NATO, which is the bedrock Western institution securing international order for the past 80 years. They do not want to see that Western institution and alliance become greater and more powerful as they are trying to establish their own alternatives. So they probably didn't like the fact that in the past year, NATO added some members. Finland joined NATO in April and Sweden is soon to follow. They're actually having a vote in I guess, a day or two to uh, see if Hungary will relent and allow Sweden to join NATO. But NATO is now comprised of 31 countries, which is a lot. And if Sweden joins, which it looks like it probably will, that means that NATO will be comprised of 32 countries. So NATO is growing. They, Russia, China, and Iran would probably like to weaken and diminish, I know they would like to weaken and diminish NATO. What would be a great way to do that? getting Turkey out of there. And Turkey, for them, would be one of the easiest countries to sever from NATO. Let's go through some facts about why that would be the case. First, as I mentioned, Turkey is the only Muslim-majority member of NATO. In addition, 
It is a very, very, very formidable strategic asset to NATO. And accordingly, it would be a very formidable strategic asset to Russia, China, and Iran if they could pluck off Turkey and bring Turkey into their alternative non-Western hegemonic order. Because Turkey has a very, very, very good and strategic location. This is kind of amazing. I was researching this article and I knew that Turkey was vital because of its location on the Black Sea and on the Mediterranean. But then I reacquainted myself with the map and I was reminded that Turkey is the only nation in the world bordering Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. That's amazing. Greece and Bulgaria are the two European countries which Turkey borders. Georgia and Armenia are the two Asian, if you will, countries that Turkey borders. And then Turkey also borders Syria, Iraq, and Iran, which are the Middle Eastern countries. So given that Turkey is a member of NATO in that strategic location, it means that NATO, including the West, or excuse me, including America, and obviously the, these Western countries, have intelligence operatives in Turkey. They have uh, gathering posts there. They have military bases. So imagine this from China, Russia, and Iran's perspective. If they could get Turkey away from NATO and towards them, that means that those American and other Western countries who have bases, intelligence gathering posts, and troops in Turkey, that means that they would have to withdraw those troops, get rid of those intelligence gathering posts. And that means that Russia, China, and Iran could then step in and replace them. And again, that would be extremely vital and good for them given that Turkey is in this vital location bordering Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. Additionally, Turkey has the second largest army in NATO. They have a spectacularly robust armed forces. The United States is the number one biggest uh, army in NATO. Turkey is number two. And Turkey's army is double the size of the third place biggest army in NATO, France. So again, big strategic location and and very just helpful in, in many different ways for the West to have NATO or the West to have Turkey in NATO. And all of those benefits that the West reaps from having Turkey in NATO, Russia, China, and, and Iran would reap if they could get Turkey out of NATO and towards them. OK. OK. So now we understand, Julie, why Russia, China and Iran. I feel like I'm a, I'm a high school history teacher going over what we've learned. But again, it's important to take it slow. So you may be thinking, OK, I can understand why Russia, China and Iran might want to pluck Turkey out of NATO. But again, what does this have to do with the Israel Gaza war? Well, as I said, let's consider some facts here. They R Russia, China and Iran are very strategic people. They have a very keen understanding of what kinds of things are going to tick off certain countries and what kinds of developments could serve to divide and diminish their adversaries. They are very aware that a drawn out war in Gaza, which will be streamed online, it already is, there are many graphic photos coming out of that, they know that a, a war in Gaza where a Western power using Western military equipment and intelligence is going in and using that against Sunni Muslims is going to wreak a lot of havoc across the world. We're already seeing it in the Western world. People here in the United States are so divided. There are all of these pro-Palestine protests from the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. It has led to huge outcomes already. Universities have been under fire. Donors have pulled their money from these universities. People have died. There was a Muslim boy who was stabbed, I believe, in Illinois. He was six years old, and he was stabbed by this true Islamophobe. There were these Jewish individuals all across the country, including here in Los Angeles, who were killed because they were Jewish. They know the kind of havoc that it is going to wreak around the world. We see in France, in Britain, 
in in many parts of Europe, there are these protests and there there are these divides. And so let's imagine what this is looking like in Turkey. If, if this is having such an impact on dividing and diminishing the West and causing strife among populations in the West, imagine again how the Sunni Muslim Turkish population is reacting to having fellow Sunni Muslims in Gaza have to endure a Western Israeli attack and be displaced from their homes and the resultant humanitarian crisis. They're not reacting well. Let's look at how not well they are reacting. On an October 25th speech to the Turkish parliament, President Erdogan of Turkey issued a stunning departure with his Western allies. This is really amazing that a NATO member country is saying stuff like this. He said in this October 7th speech, Hamas is not a terrorist group. It is a group of liberators who protect their land. He went on, you will not find any other state than Israel whose army behaves with such inhumanity. He further attacked his Western allies in NATO. He said, Western powers shed tears for Israel and do nothing else. He said, those who mobilized, and he's again referring, if not explicitly, but implicitly to his NATO allies, those who mobilized the world in favor of Ukraine, but did not speak out against the massacres in, in Gaza, is the most blatant sign of their hypocrisy. I know I kind of phrased that incorrectly. Those who mobilized the, the world in favor of Ukraine did not speak out against the massacres in Gaza is the most blatant sign of their hypocrisy. As long as innocent people continue to die in Gaza, no ship or plane, Erdogan is saying, sent to our region will bring peace. As he was giving this October 25th speech, calling Hamas liberators while excoriating Israel and his fellow Western allies in NATO, the audience of Turkish, le Turkish legislators were chanting Alu Akbar and down with Israel. And that was not the only such speech that Erdogan gave in the the days, and I outline a lot of this in the article, I'm not going to give all of the quotes, but just so that you have an idea, Erdogan doubled down, called Israel an occupier and a war criminal, and further praised Hamas as liberators. And he said, only the Palestinian flag will fly here in Turkey. There was obviously a swift reaction from Israel. The Israeli foreign ministry immediately recalled its diplomats in Turkey responded in turn by recalling its ambassador to Israel. So again, I ask the question, how do you think the constituent Turkish Sunni Muslim population is reacting to seeing fellow Sunni Muslims being attacked by a Western power using Western military and intelligence? We see how they are reacting. They are siding with Gaza, they're siding with Hamas, they're siding with fellow Sunni Muslims, okay? China, Russia, and Iran, I'm not saying that they orchestrated this whole October 7th attack with the sole intention of severing Turkey from NATO. Maybe they did, I don't know. That's It's incredibly speculative. But what I am saying is that they are aware that the October 7th attack on Israel, if they were involved, was likely going to provoke Israel to invade Gaza, and that, that that would create a humanitarian crisis and a resultant refugee crisis in Gaza, and that would divide Western populations and especially incense the Sunni Muslim Turkish population, and it may serve to help diminish Turkey's ties to the West and perhaps even lead to Turkey formally severing its ties with NATO and the European Union. Quick note, for accuracy. Turkey actually doesn't belong to the European Union. It has sought admission for the past 24, yes, 24 years, and it enjoys uh, certain trade agreements with the European Union. But the reason why the European Union has, has, um, 
hesitated to formally make Turkey a member is because they have voiced concern over certain human rights violations that are practiced by the Turkish government. But again, Turkey is sort of a de facto member of the European Union. That's why I'm including it in this analysis. But interestingly, and again, Russia, China, and Iran are well aware of this, Turkey under President Erdogan has expressed a desire already to try to move away from the West. And maybe a potent accelerant to making that tie official would be this war in Gaza. Let's go back to September, the month before October, in case you didn't know. <laughs> Sean's laughing. Maybe I'm getting too explainy here. I'm just trying to outline that it was very close to this October 7th attack. In September, the month before October, this is important though, so listen, the European Union adopted a European Parliament report recommending that Turkey not be admitted formally to the European Union, okay? So for 24 years, Turkey's trying to get into the European Union. They have a sort of de facto membership agreement. And then in September, the European Parliament issued this report saying, yeah, we're going to keep Turkey out. They did recommend that the European Union continue to have a parallel and realistic framework for economic ties with Turkey, but Turkey got the message. Sort of a tie, but no formal membership of Turkey into the European Union. So at once, President Erdogan of Turkey announced, quote, the EU is trying to break away from Turkey. And he added, quote, we will make our evaluations against those developments, and if necessary, we will part ways with the European Union. So Erdogan has already expressed an interest in kind of severing ties with the West or moving away from the West. And also Erdogan himself, in addition to these statements, he himself as a political figure bases a lot of his identity off of this kind of anti-Western slant. I did a show on Timeless about Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. Mustafa Kemal Ataturk was the first president of the Republic of Turkey 100 years ago in 1923 after the Ottoman Empire collapsed and Turkey was made into its own individual country. Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, as you will know from that Timeless episode, was a very, very pro-Western leader. He actually banned the hijab, which is the head covering that is mandated by those in Muslim-majority countries that, that women must wear. He banned the fez, which was the hat in the Ottoman Empire, which was seen by Mustafa Kemal Ataturk as kind of this backward Muslim relic of the past. Mustafa Kemal Ataturk was the great modernizer. He brought in these American diplomats to rework Turkey's education system to make it more American. The Turkish alphabet is actually very, very similar to the English alphabet. So for, for a long time, Turkey was very pro-Western under Ataturk, and Erdogan has positioned himself as kind of a rebuke of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. He has said that, that Turkey needs to re-embrace its Muslim roots. Contrary to pursuing closer ties with the West, Turkey needs to lean in, again, to its, its uh, ties to the Ottoman Empire, which was the, the Muslim Empire, its Islamic heritage, the fact that most of the population is Muslim. So that's very important to note that Erdogan himself is already positioning himself and has expressed a proclivity to move away from the West. And to really hammer it home again, China, Russia, and Iran are aware that a good way to perhaps accelerate that process would be this war in Gaza. And so finally, I'll just throw out there because I know that there's a lot of information that we've covered. I also outlined in the American Mind article some things that China could offer to Turkey to make this formal, formal severing with NATO, the EU, and the West 
more attractive to Turkey. I talk about the Kurdistan Workers Party, which has fought a 45-year separatist guerrilla war against the Turkish government. China could come in and say, hey, Turkey, we will offer you our full support in crushing this insurgency. Also, there's the issue of Cyprus. Cyprus is an island that is south of Turkey. It is in the Mediterranean Sea. It's actually right off the coast of not just Turkey, but also Syria, Lebanon, and Israel. Cyprus is controlled right now. There's kind of a, a, I mean, there is a divide in the way that Cyprus is controlled. The north of Cyprus is controlled by Turkey. The south of Cyprus, the bottom two thirds is controlled by Greece. China knows how important Cyprus is to Turkey. China could go in and offer their help to have Turkey achieve undisputed control of Cyprus, kicking the Greeks out. As a quick history lesson, the Turks and the Greeks hate each other. The Turks would love to see Cyprus be totally unified under Turkish control. So again, those are just things that if you're really interested in this, you can read in the article. But I just wanted to throw that in there for your consideration and also to show you that, yes, this is very speculative, but I'm trying to really see the bigger picture and again consider who would stand to benefit, what are the prizes that China, Russia, and Iran could dangle in front of Turkey to make their their, uh, leaving the Western bloc, if you will, more attractive. And so... That that is what I have come up with through hours and hours and hours and hours of research. And the final thing that I'll leave you with as something to consider, if you are not fully convinced of this Julie Hartman severing Turkey from NATO hypothesis or carving Turkey from NATO, as my title says, I would like us to remember how useful it has been to Russia and China, and to Hamas, and to Hezbollah, and to all of these forces which hate Israel, the United States, and the West, I would like us to remember how useful it has been to those groups, the Iran severing from the West that occurred in 1979. Like Turkey for most of its history, of the in the 20th century I should say Iran for a lot of the 20th century was actually very pro-western I also have a uh, episode on this with timeless I believe it's called and Iran I go through the 20th century history of Iran Iran was one of the biggest supporters of Israel in the 50s, 60s, and 70s because of the American and British-backed coup in 1953, which ousted Mossadegh and reinstalled the Shah of Iran as the the leader of of Iran. The Shah was very pro-Western, modeled himself in many ways off of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, very pro-American, very, very pro-Israel. And then in 1979, this revolution happened. I go through all of the kind of threads and the causes of the revolution in that Iran episode. And then Iran turned from a very pro-Israel, very pro-Western, Western cultural state to a radical, savage, Shiite fundamentalist country where women, I mean, my God, have to get killed for strands of hair that poke through their hijab. Women do not have equal rights as men. They have to get permission from their uh, husbands and fathers to go get an education, to go to work. It has just turned into this radical, radical uh, Islamic state. And literally, because of that revolution, Iran went from, again, being very pro-Israel to to being... the one of the biggest forces on earth that is pushing to eradicate Israel. It is in the constitution of the Islamic Republic of Iran that one of their goals is to annihilate the state of Israel. Again, just want to offer this for your consideration. Think about how useful it has been to those practicing evil, those who are anti-Western, to pluck Iran off and bring Iran to their side. They know that if they can do that with Turkey, there will there will be a similarly long-term beneficial outcome for them. Get a my pillow and go to sleep after this. It's been a lot of information, or get a glass of wine to let it all sink in. But seriously, 
Um, I know it's specul- speculative. I'm not saying anything is for sure, but I have a feeling that over the next few years, and it may take years, there will be some evidence or some indicators that will come out that make my hypotheses seem a little less crazy to you if they indeed do seem crazy. But I hope they don't. I encourage you to read these two articles. I'm very proud of them. Again, the first one published at the end of October in the Epic Times is called Pay No Attention to the Country Behind the Curtain. And the second one published in the beginning of November, Carving Turkey from NATO. You heard it here, my friends. Thank you for being with me. I hope to see you soon.